Hi everyone, welcome back um, from what I hope was a restful and um, relaxing week off, uh, at least from our class. I'm sure you had a lot of other work going on, but I hope you got a nice little reprieve uh, from History 103 last week. We are moving right into the second half of this semester, so um, be sure to see the recap video when that's posted. I'm going to walk through a little bit of my feedback on, on the first paper and about reading primary sources. Uh, I'm recording this on Sunday, July 5th, uh, and I'm going to post it then too. I don't plan on having the recap video done probably until Monday, um, but that will still give people plenty of time um, to see the recap video. But I do want you to check that out um, because I'm going to be walking through a little bit about how to read primary sources because I think we could use a little bit of a refresher about primary sources and about what a historian does. But because this week's major assignment doesn't actually have us look at any text, we're looking at statues. I have no problem posting these lectures uh, before I have the recap finished. So this week, week number five, uh, we are looking at um, colonialism in Asia and in Africa. So we're dividing this week into two lectures. Uh, the first is going to ask us about how colonialism in the 19th and 20th centuries uh, was different than colonialism that took place in the Americas between 1492 and roughly 1775. Um, you know, this first wave of colonialism that took place after Columbus's discovery uh, of the Americas, comparing it with the second wave of colonialism that mostly took place in uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, and Africa, asking how they were different, but also how they were similar. And then in the second lecture, we'll look more specifically at comparing the scramble for Africa uh, with colonization that occurred in Southeast Asia. So for this uh, first lecture, we're really going to be focusing, starting first on actually Europe and the Americas, strangely enough, before we shift our attention to Southeast Asia, where we're going to look specifically at British India and also uh, at China uh, under imperial colonization. So just to give us a quick refresher where we left off, here's a map of industrial Europe. Uh, we left off talking about the industrialization. We talked a bit about socialism, about Marx, about Marx's ideas. Um, but what I want to remind you of is that beginning in the late 18th, early 19th century, different regions of Europe industrialized at different times. Uh, they were led by Great Britain, which was the first to industrialize, and then parts of northern France and also what will become Germany really led uh, European industrialization. And the important thing about industrialization, at least for how we're concerned about it in this week, is that it really advanced uh, European nations far beyond uh, many other nations of the world, including the United States, until the United States catches up in industrialization a little bit later uh, in the 19th century. So when we talk about industrialization, you know, from last week and why it's important to this week, to week five, we have to remember that there's kind of like two big outcomes of industrialization, at least on a global scale. Um, the first is that European industrial complex, right, the, the building of industrial nations was both fed by and attracted to foreign markets. And Strayer and Nelson make this point on page 782. What does that mean, right? It means that raw materials coming from uh, the New World, from Southeast Asia, from Africa, things like cotton, wood, coal, rubber, and there's other things as well. Um, most of these things came from outside of Europe, but they were really fundamental in having industrialization uh, progress, right? Industrialization couldn't have happened uh, without these raw materials. And you might be saying, Professor, well, how does cotton feed into the Industrial Revolution? Well, don't forget, one of the main things that was being produced as the population of Europe and the world was beginning to rise around the mid 19th century was cloth, fabric, the things you wear. And so much of this cloth uh, and textile was produced by cotton. So we can understand how wood and coal and rubber can feed industrialization, but cotton was key uh, to this idea too. And most of these raw materials came from outside of Europe um, because while Europe did have, Europeans did have access to coal, especially in Great Britain, uh, Northern France, and also what becomes Germany, uh, other regions didn't. So they had to import it from other places. And cotton was not grown in Europe at all. And so uh, most of the cotton had to be either shipped in from the southeastern United States uh, until the Civil War when it was transferred over to Egypt and India and Pakistan. Um, but these materials were coming in from other places. So these raw materials fueled the Industrial Revolution, um, but also Europeans eyed the large markets, especially in places like India and China, where the population was much larger 
um, than in France or in England or even the United States. Europeans eyed these large populations with a recognition that there were very large markets out there. And if European made products could reach these large markets, it would only further enhance a, a nation's capital and their power and their ability um, to industrialize. So uh, the industrialization was both fed by and also attracted to foreign markets. Another important thing we have to remember is that the industrialization of Europe led to a very important militarization. The end of uh, Napoleon's um, conquest of Europe was in 1815. He's defeated in 1815. And in 1815, the European nations come together in Vienna, in Austria, to decide a new kind of map of Europe. And what they decide on was a balance of power, and I've got it in a map in just a moment. But they create this balance of power that was meant to kind of stop further wars from happening. And it's incredibly successful, actually. Um, balancing the power of France and England with Russia and the German Confederation, which was a bunch of different states in what's now Germany, created relative peace between 1815 and 1914. But that peace really begins to unravel in 1871. Because in 1871, the German Confederation, which had been a loose organization of states, is unified after a war with France into one single nation, Germany. And so what this does is it creates a uh, imbalance of power or a growing imbalance of power that negates that, that, con uh, that concert of Europe that was created at the Congress of Vienna in 1815. And so basically Germany and the unification of it throws off uh, the balance of power, which leads to growing militarization. There's a race to become the most dominant military power uh, in Europe. Uh, and so you have Germany, France, Russia, Great Britain, all of them competing to be the major dominant military power in Europe. And just, I've got kind of some images here to kind of bring up what I was just saying before. But this is a little bit about how um, raw materials fed the Industrial Revolution. On the left, you can see raw materials coming from the Americas. And then on the right, you have these large markets in a place like China, 19th century China, which were teeming with people, which the industrial powers of Europe knew um, that if they could get their products there, they could turn a tremendous profit. And then down here, I have these maps, and make sure to check the PDF uh, when I post of it if you want to look at this a little bit further. But you'll see on the left, this is a map of Europe in 1815 um, after the, con uh, the Congress of Vienna. And you can see the kind of balance of power that's created. And then on the right is Europe in 1871. And you'll notice that new German Empire right smack uh, in the middle of Europe is what threw off the balance of power and led to growing uh, militarization. All of this is going to become very important in just a moment when we look at kind of global affairs and we recognize how the need for markets and growing militarization led to colonization. But another important event happened all the way back in 1823. Um, the Monroe Doctrine, passed by President Monroe, James Monroe of the United States, effectively closed the Americas to further European colonization. James Monroe issued this document saying, listen, the Americas, you know, uh, whether that be the United States, Mexico, anywhere in the Caribbean, South America, all of these places are closed to any further uh, European colonization. It was passed at a time where uh, the Latin American nations were fighting for their independence, and it was meant to kind of deter any country, whether it be Spain or Portugal or France or uh, Great Britain, from interfering in the Americas. The United States could do it, and they do quite often, but the European powers were banned from interfering uh, in the United States. And in 1823, the United States is still a very small nation. It's not incredibly powerful on the world stage, so it doesn't mean much. But when the United States plunged into its own civil war between 1860 and 1865, the European powers recognized, hey, they're too concentrated with their own war to enforce this Monroe Doctrine. And actually, France invades Mexico in 1862. You know, for those of us who celebrate um, Cinco de Mayo, and you're, uh, people ask you what it's about, Americans don't really know, right? Um, but it's actually about uh, the uh, Mexican defeat of uh, the French power, and you think to yourself, well, what were the French doing uh, in Mexico? Well, the French were there trying to seize land back in the Americas with the U.S. unable to enforce their own Monroe Doctrine. Um, but after 1865, the Civil War is over, and the U.S. forces France to get out, an emperor that they had installed from a, a very powerful European family is actually executed in Mexico uh, shortly thereafter. But the Monroe Doctrine can be strictly enforced again after 1865. 
So the European powers that are growing militarily and looking for foreign markets have to look elsewhere. They can't look to the Americas because the United States has specifically said, listen, these areas are closed to further imperial imperialization. So where then do the Europeans look? Well, their first eyes are cast to Asia, right? Specifically because um, both the Netherlands and the East Indies, and we talked a little bit about, about this about two weeks ago, we talked about the Netherlands, the Dutch, and the East Indies, right? These trading port empires they had created in the Indian Ocean. But also the British in India had demonstrated that Southeast Asia could be incredibly lucrative, not in ownership of land, right? This wasn't land that was being grabbed in order to move populations over. You didn't have uh, tens of thousands of British immigrants to India in the same way that you had British immigrants to North America. And you didn't have Dutch people flocking to the East Indies either. Instead, you had trading post empires. And just like um, the Dutch and the Portuguese had demonstrated that trading post empires can be powerful in the East Indies down there, as you can see on this map, the British demonstrated that India could be a very profitable trading empire. For one specific reason, the British were interested in, in the manufacture of opium. Now, opium is a uh, narcotic. It's, it's made from poppy seeds, specifically grown uh, in northwestern uh, India, an area that's actually now today Pakistan, uh, grows uh, tremendous amounts of poppies. And the poppy seeds can be distilled down uh, into opium, which is an incredibly addictive narcotic. Now, opium was illegal in Great Britain. So the British couldn't grow and distill opium in India and send it back to Great Britain. They couldn't send it to the United States but they could send it to China, where they had also established a couple of trading ports uh, on the eastern shores of China. And they do this in massive amounts, first under the East India Company, which actually controlled all of India until 1858, when there was an uprising that needed the British army to put down. And after the British army puts down this uprising in India in 1858, the crown takes over India directly. But they continue to ship opium, this incredibly addictive narcotic, from India into China. And the Chinese are kind of aghast that this is going on. They recognize that opium has a very negative effect on the populations, and so they actually ban the sale uh, of opium uh, to uh, directly to uh, the Chinese in the 1830s. And you can see here on uh, this little graphic in the upper left how much opium was being sent. You know, in 1650, there's very little, you know, as late as 1822, there's very little opium, but beginning in the 1830s, Opium is being um, just thrust into these uh, Chinese markets at massive scales. It's growing exponentially. And the Chinese uh, try to ban its importation, like I said, in 1838. Uh, but the British actually respond by bombing the, um, from, the, from their naval ships in the, in the harbor, bombing uh, these Chinese ports and forcing them in two different wars that are known as the Opium Wars, the first in the 1830s and early 1840s, uh, and the second in the 1850s, two opium wars that forced the Chinese to open their ports. This is actually also when Hong Kong gets transferred from Chinese control uh, to British control. But this just demonstrates to kind of the rest of the world how lucrative it can be uh, to control parts of Southeast Asia. The sale of opium from India to China had no negative effects on the British Empire, right? In fact, they were able to expand their empire. They grab Hong Kong. They're making a tremendous amount of profit selling this dangerous and very addictive drug in Chinese markets. And so other countries uh, from Europe in particular and the United States are interested in getting involved in the colonization of Southeast Asia. So you can see I blew up this map for you for a moment. And that pretty much by the turn of the 20th century, all of Southeast Asia is going to be controlled uh, by different powers uh, from, uh, from Europe and with also some tremendous amount of influence from the United States. So you can see India, which also includes now um, Pakistan, the entire nation of Pakistan, and uh, large portions of Southeast Asia, what's called Indochina, is going to be under control uh, by the British. The French are going to be involved. They grab that large area that becomes called French Indochina. For those of you who are kind of apt with 20th century American history, this is Vietnam. Uh, and this is why the United States get involved in Vietnam in the 20th century. You can see the Dutch still holding very strong to the East Indies. The British have grabbed Borneo of the northern East Indies. The Spanish hold the Philippines, which they will uh, until the Second World War, when, uh, or until the Spanish-American War, sorry, when the Americans seize it and then lose it during the Second World War to the Japanese. It's really only Japan and China that remain independent, and China's independent in name only. It's actually controlled by spheres of influence uh, from the French and the British and the Americans who use these ports to make money. 
In the next lecture, we'll learn a little bit about how a very similar process is replicated in Africa.